Yeah. This, yeah. And, and they still going. Yeah. I see y'all going. <laughs> For the months. She, I, I'm with her. She on the right frequency. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Let's set the temperature it's, right. It's called, it's called yeah. the biggest for a reason. They don't do it like us, man. First and foremost, Diddy. Let's just, we're going to have a crazy conversation, but let's take a moment, man. Look at this. Look at this, bro. Hold on. Let me see y'all. Let me see what's going on out there. Where the, where the hustlers at? Where the real hustlers at? Hey, I just want to say, I just want to take a second to give my brothers their flowers. Earn your leisure, Rashad and Troy, what they have ignited in our community for financial literacy is something that is needed and something that's God sent. And this right here is the Hustlers Super Bowl. <laughs> and so let's just make some noise for these two brothers right here for teaching us and showing us the way. Earn your leisure. Nah, this is crazy, man. This is crazy. Super Bowl. I like it. <sighs> I, I like let's, that. Let's get into it, man. We got a lot to talk about, but let's start. Let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. So, yeah. you know, I want to know, starting Bad Boy Records, right? To me, definitely top two, top three labels ever when it comes to hip hop music, right? Inspired you to have that vision in the early 90s. It's trendy to have a record label now, but especially the way you did it as far as hiring the top producers, making sure you had the top in-house talent. You kind of navigated it very strategically. What was your thought process when you was 19 years old doing that? I would have to say, starting Bad Boy, I, I had to tap into the love, you know. Um, I fell in love with hip hop the first day I heard like this battle mixtape of the Treacherous Three versus the Funky 4 plus 1. Y'all may not know about any of this. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was like the upcoming rap groups that weren't, didn't have any other exposure until the Sugar Hill Gang came. And when the Sugar Hill Gang record dropped and I heard it played on the station WBLS, I knew that hip hop had arrived. And so I started looking at it as a possible career. But it really came to me when I was at the Fresh Fest in the late 80s when I saw Run DMC in Madison Square Garden hold up, tell everybody to hold up their Adidas, and 30,000 people from the sound of this black man's voice held up some Adidas. And so I was like, this is about to become a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry, and I want in. And so with Bad Boy, Bad Boy was, you know, the representation of how I saw music and saw music marketing and grooming artists um, coming up having studied the greats like Barry Gordy, Russell Simmons, I was able to see the possibility. Andre Harrell, who gave me my chance, I was taught and I was minted, I was able to see the possibilities. But with Bad Boy, I wanted to be disruptive. You know, my whole thing is disruption, disruption, disruption. You know, I'm trying to, trying to go shake up the system and, and, and make sure that we as artists and we as a people get treated equally. And so for me with the record company, I had to look bigger than hip hop at the time because they wasn't letting hip hop be global. If y'all see that Savage video of me, that's me finally, finally getting an ad on MTV, you know? So that's how intense and rough it was for black artists. And, um, you know, I was always fueled by that purpose. Number one was to make people dance and make people feel good through my music. And then number two was ownership. I wanted to make sure that I owned my own business. I wanted to own my own label and I wanted to be independent. Some of the icons, you brought up Barry Gordy. You said Russell Simmons, obviously, rest in peace, Andre Harrell. Something that was intricate about you was that not only did you produce the records, but you were able to identify, curate, nurture, and help flourish talent. Not the easiest thing to do, right? Talk about how that was encompassing part of your entrepreneurial journey, right? Because it was, yeah, it's cool to start a label. Oh, yeah, I definitely, we talk about the bad boy story, but that's not my whole story. I have to give you all the whole story. So I thought I was going to be a professional NFL football player. 
I really, you know, I didn't have no plan B. And then the last year of school, I broke my leg. And so my dream was deferred. I got very depressed. I did not know what I was going to do. I was lost. I started just going to the clubs to dance my pain away. And so through that process of just dancing in a club and, and using music to, to survive, I was able to get picked up and get seen and, and got an opportunity with my talent as like a background dancer. So, so they would see me dancing in the club and they were like, come on, you want to be in this video? So then I would go to the video shoot and I would see the executives and I would see how, they were, how the artists treated the executives. And I was like, I don't know what he does, but I know I want to do that. And I was blessed with this talent to be able to hear hits, to be able to create imaging, marketing. I don't know where it came from. It's a God-given talent, but I knew what to put on Jodeci, what to put on Mary. Um, and, you know, it was, it, it was something that was a blessing. It was something that was a, a, a talent to be able to do that. And so I started from the bottom. And so I was doing everything from the background dances to the styling, to, so by the time I got to Bad Boy, to a and r by the time I got to Bad Boy and got my chance, and I only got my chance through a negative situation. So anybody out there going through a negative situation, you have to know, stay steady in the storm. I got, yeah. So, all right, so let's get now, into I, I got to say, yeah, I got fired. I got to tell you the whole Andre story. Harrell, Bad right? Boy. Andre Harrell fired me. And so that that adversity kind of pushed me into my bad boy purpose. I was scared. I remember I was fired. I was outside of Andre's house, stalking him, crying, wait, hoping that he would come and I could talk him into giving me my job back. Um, but as Andre said, he didn't fire me to hurt me. He fired me to make me rich. And so he gave me my independence and that's the bad boy story. So, Cheers for that. For that. So I want to, I want to, all right, so now let's get into this. Diageo situation, right? So I want to talk about the relationship with Diageo. So this lawsuit that you brought against them, right? People might not know, but I think Pharrell was the actual first one to sue Diageo. And it was for unfair treatment. So you had a historic relationship with them 15 years, going back to Ciroc, Deleon, I never even heard of Ciroc until you started doing the commercials, blew it out the water, then you had Deleon, and everything looked like it was on the up and up, owned by a black man and all that, so a lot of people was confused when the lawsuit came about. You shared some information with us when we came to your house that we wasn't aware of. So can you really talk about that? Because I think it's a very interesting case study for entrepreneurs to understand. Definitely. Um, the situation's in the courts now, so I'm going to share with y'all what I can. This is all public record. But basically, I was brought, I was called to have a meeting with Diageo, and they knew that I was kind of killing things in the culture, and they were trying to fix their diversity problem. And through that, a meeting was set up, and I told them, you know, I, I want to be an owner, that I have these ideas from promoting parties at Howard, just remembering that I will always get the door and never get the bar. And so I said, I have aspirations to have black owned brands owned by black people behind the bar and a part of your organization. They're the biggest distributor of spirits in the world, biggest maker of spirits in the world. So we get a test project. I'm looking at their portfolio and they say we can start something from scratch, but I'm looking at their portfolio and I remember one night I was having a, a great, great time with Ciroc. I had some Ciroc, it was made by grapes, and I remember, you know, having just such the greatest time. And so the light bulb went off in my head. I said, I don't want to wait and develop nothing. Let me show you what I could do with Ciroc. Let me show you what, how I could turn your revenue around. They were losing $40 million a year. And I went and turned it around and took it to 2.6 million cases from 40,000 cases. Okay? And so this is something that's never been yeah, done. Clap it up for that. And so, and so 15 years later, even though I had that success, 
I was always fighting for Ciroc not to be pigeonholed, not to be pigeonholed as a black brand, not to be pigeonholed as an urban brand. I already went through that. I went through that with Sean John. They put me in the urban section. I had to go and disrupt the fashion industry, pull up on Fashion Week, and show them what that black excellence swag is about. And that's what we did with Sean John. And so with Ciroc, it was the same thing, getting into the spirits industry. No matter what industry I went into, I always came up against this ceiling that they just wanted to keep me in the colored section. I would say for businesses, you have white-only business, just like you have white-only bathrooms back in the days, and you have black-only business. And so my fight is to always make sure that we could just do business. I want to be treated equally like anybody else. And so that's what the fight is about. And it's not me just fighting for me. I'm fighting for us. Because whatever bar I set, y'all have to come behind me on that bar, and I want to make sure that it's right. So that's what the fight is about, simply put. And the last thing, to make it clear, was with Deleon. I still own Deleon, okay? So with Deleon, I sent my people... Before you tell the story about that, just talk about the process of getting Deleon, right? Because it was you okay. moved yourself with Ciroc, and so now there's yeah. an opportunity to create something else. With a lot of... Um, first of all, corporate America is made and built for white men. So when you're going into corporate America, usually your entryway is to help them with a diversity problem. But at the end of the day, you want to be able to open up doors. Sometimes you got to take that opportunity and get in. And so that's what I did with Ciroc. But I told them I don't, I don't work for nobody. Everything in my portfolio I own. So you guys have to know my ultimate dream is a tequila. Since I was a kid, I remember drinking tequila or being afraid to drink tequila at first. Since not a kid, a teenager. <laughs> Correction, please. Correction. I mean, I was over 21. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was 21 at Howard. I remember it. Yeah, but, but tequila used to have a worm in it. That's how dangerous they used to, like, market it. But I was like, I really love tequila. And this was before the whole tequila craze. So it's like you make a deal. You make a deal like, I'm going to advance this for you. So then we could be good partners and you could give me what I want, which is my opportunity for me to own my brand and to be able to build generational wealth for my kids and my people. And I just need the same 24 hours as y'all giving everybody else in your portfolio. And I couldn't get that. I had to send my people down to Mexico. And this is just to tell you what the fight is about. They went down to Mexico. And when they got down there, they found out that there was zero agave planted for Deleon. So there was no plan for us to be successful. It was no equal treatment. The other brands, they had agave planted. They had no agave planted for me. And sometimes you have to go check even your partners to see what's really going on. And so when I saw that, I was like, nah, nah, I'm going to fight because it's bigger than me. It's, 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 it's about not just me, it's about we, it's about all of us. So I chose, I, chose my perfect, my, I chose my purpose over profit. And that's the whole Deleon situation. Yeah, you, you brought up distribution. Yeah, clap it up for that. You brought up distribution and you come from the music world. And so distribution is a... Hold on, I need to say this. I need y'all to still support Deleon. <laughs> you know, we're going we gonna to win this. <laughs> Believe that. Still support Deleon, y'all. Still owned by a black man. It's owned still by a black owned man. Owned by a black man. Owned by a black man. You, you, you come from the music world where distribution means one thing. For some of the audience who may not be familiar, I'm sure they could consume spirits, but they don't really know what it means to have distribution inside of that space. What, what does that look like? Uh, when you're building a brand like Deleon and Tara. Yeah. Um, supply and distribution is everything. Whether you came from the streets, we all know that. We learned that at a very young age. And so no matter how I market a product, if they just keep me in black neighborhoods through the distribution, I can never grow. I can never be as great as I could be or as great as we can be. You know what I'm saying? I had to go from me to we. And so when I started really looking at every decision I was making, I was like that this is something that I have to change. I can't just come and get this check and not be changing the way the ecosystem is. So 
if you want to have a successful brand, you have to have, number one is you have to have the supply to meet the demand, and then you have to have the distribution. And so if people control your supply and control your distribution, they control your future. And so that's what I'm fighting for right now. So let's talk about um, Ciroc. Is, is that one of the biggest regrets that you made as far as not having equity in Ciroc? Um, no, it's not a regret. Everybody has a journey. And that's just really how, you know, corporate America works. You got you, you to gotta pay your dues to get in and they make us prove ourselves over and over and over. And um, I don't have any regrets because the, the journey, the journey was the most important. And also, I'm not really letting Sarah go. So, you know, so I, I'm going through this, but it's part of the journey. So, so I had to go through, the, through this to be able to get to this point. But when you spoke to us, it was enlightening because even if you look at a lot of the billionaires in our culture, it's because of spirits. When you look at Jay, you look at yourself, a lot of people have made their money not so much on the music side, but on the spirit side. Then you look at somebody like George Clooney, who's one of the greatest actors of all time. He became a billionaire because of tequila on the low. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like when you were saying how other brands were put in bars and put in restaurants and there was marketing dollars behind that, that's why you heard of these liquors that you never heard of before. They weren't putting your liquor in, in the same places and they was actually just relying on your star power and not giving you the marketing dollar. It's kind of like fighting with your hands cuffed. So I think it's great to communicate that because from the outside in, it could be looked at as like, that's just somebody's rich problems. Like, yeah. like you know what I'm saying? But it's, it's like you said, it's bigger than you because it's like, all right, this is a problem that's faced across the board where black companies get less funding, black companies get less promotion, less distribution. If you look at InvestFest, look how many people is here right now. There's no reason why we shouldn't have $10 million in corporate sponsorships, right? If we was a white entity and it was all white people, every single corporation in America would be sponsoring InvestFest, right? Facts, facts. But these are, the, these are the problems that are hard to communicate because it's like most people, you just, you're worried about, you know, paycheck to paycheck, right? So you're not worrying about that, but it's like on a higher level, these are the, there's different levels of racism. This is the level of racism that you don't see. So it looks like, oh, we millionaires and we get 15,000 people, but it's like somebody else can do a fraction of this and get way more money and way and be on CNBC and be on Bloomberg. But when we get on, it's, it's for diversity or a black initiative or a black history month. These, that's a systemic problem in this country that's hard to communicate because people don't fully understand it. And you told me, so you was like, on your level, there's issues that's hard to communicate because we don't understand it because we're not at the billionaire level. So I think it's just important to, it's always every level that you go to, there's different hurdles. Yes. Um, one of the things I've been blessed to see is having 30 years in corporate America with partnerships and we have to come to the reality that nobody is coming to save us. No one is coming to save us. Out of all the business revenue in America, only 1% goes to black businesses. But then there's an accountability from us because we have a $1.8 trillion buying power and only 2% of that we circulate in our own communities. So we can't complain. We know what it is. It's time to change the tone. We have to unify our dollars else nothing will change. We have to weaponize the almighty black dollar to save us because we can't have these festivals and conventions, but then we leave here and we don't understand the power of our $1.8 trillion spending power that we only give 2% to ourselves. So I'm here to speak from love, I'm love. Self-love is making sure that you take care of yourself your family and your people first. And you can't wait for nobody to come save you. So there, there is a solution. 
things, things are definitely dismal as far as what's planned for us. But there's a way out. If we unify, but we got to truly, truly unify. We have to truly, truly start making decisions that support our communities. We can't think that there's a government grant that's going to come and, and, and just free us all. We have to get to hustling, working together, and changing the tone. Yeah. That's a fact. You know, one of our other conversations, the, the word disruption kept coming up. And you were so adamant about it. And when we, we walked away from it, it was like, how can we be as disruptive? And it's interesting because the most disruptive thing we can do is work together, right? It's something that we haven't done, right? And so I know that you just launched Empower Global. Talk about what that is and how, similar to what we're trying to do, give platforms to people in the worlds of business of all categories. What's your vision for that, Empower Global? Um, I'm a solutions-based person. You know, I don't want to just come in reiterate the problems that we already know is going on. So when, when I'm using my creativity and I'm folk, first of all, one of the things that, that being successful and having money, people kind of get your purpose messed up. They get, they, they get it fucked up, to be honest. You know what I'm saying? They don't really know what cloth you cut from because once they see you getting money, it turns into something else. But from day one, you know, for, for, for me, my purpose was always to make sure that I was working to make life better for my people. So as I looked at where we're supposed to be as a people, in 2053, they, they said we're going to have zero net wealth as a people. So I didn't want to sit there and complain about it. I'm like, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? And I remember Tulsa. And I was like, Tulsa, Black Wall Street, Black Main Street. And I was like, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of my ancestors right now. I said, I have the mind and creativity to make a global marketplace, to make the new Black Amazon where we can see ourselves circulating our dollars. I don't want to ask nobody for shit. I'm going, I'm going. It's Empowered Global. It's a solution. And it puts accountability back on us. We cannot leave this room and not have the accountability to do better. Because it's ridiculous that out of $1.8 trillion, we only love ourselves 2%. And so Empower Global was created for entrepreneurs of color all around the world and the whole diaspora to be able to tap in, to be able to support each other. And so that right there is the mission that's one of the parts of the solution, and I want everybody to go visit Empower Global, but not just visit, shop there, and know the purpose and the causes is to provide a solution. If not, we're just going to be talking about it. So my whole thing is let's get to the solution, and that's what Empower Global is. So let's talk about... And they burn Tulsa down. They can't burn this down, though. So one of the most important aspects of any society is media, right? Um, whoever controls the media controls the people. So we know about, you know, propaganda and how that's been negatively put on us. Um, but as 19 Keys likes to say, there's also positive propaganda, right? So I think that we at EYL, we provide positive propaganda where this is good stories and inspirational stories of, of people doing things. So you have a platform, Revolt, right? Which is probably the biggest black media company out there right now. And we actually have learned a lot from Revolt because we work with Revolt. We have a show on Revolt, it's family. We've been, been able to be educated from just observing somebody doing business at a, a very high level. What's the importance of Revolt? And talk about the importance of media in the black community. Yes. Media is the most powerful industry in the world. If you don't control your narrative, somebody else will control it. I built Revolt not just as a platform to follow in the footsteps of BET, which I want to just give a shout out to Bob Johnson, Kathy Hughes from Radio One, all of the 
Byron Allen. And it's, it, it, to me, it was so important that we had our own black free press. I feel in, information is so valuable and so crucial. So it wasn't like I wanted Revolt to come out and we do a bunch of reality shows. I wanted Revolt to be a, a base, a foundation of information that, that people of other colors have the luxury to have. When you watch CNN, they don't talk about us. They don't talk about our problems. We can't relate to that. Even MSNBC, they talk about a little bit more. Fox, we can't relate to it. So with Revolt, I had to, to, to look at the fact that we did not, as a people, have a free press. That means you have no voice. You can't say what you want to say. Them cats on CNN, MSNBC, Fox, they can't say what they really want to say. At Revolt, you can say what you really want to say, and that's freedom. And so that's why it was important for me to go and really, really invest in black media, to be a leader in black media, but still there lies the problem. Black media only gets 1% of advertising dollars. They feel like they negotiated with us and said, okay, we'll give you 2%. And so it's this constant struggle of whether it was, you know, when I was doing Sean John or Revolt as somebody having me, I'm knowing I'm getting into these situations and there are going to be these obstacles, but I want the smoke, you know. Um, John Lewis said, good trouble, you know, get into good trouble. And, 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 and that's what Revolt is really about. It's about shaking it up and giving, giving the voices a platform. But, but talk about that, though, because that's something that, once again, the average person is not even thinking about, but we see it as a media company where advertising dollars, right? And that's really how a media company is able to survive. Yeah. So the challenges of having to, you know, convince companies and getting less than you know that you should get and, you know, different corporate initiatives, they say that they're going to give money and they don't give money. Like these are things that's very critical because it's hard to survive as a media company for free, a free media company, if you're not getting revenue from ads. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, first of all, they are buying black media to market to y'all, but they're not buying it from, from the actual black media platforms or companies. If we don't have the resources then we don't have the ability to compete. The, the money that you make, you put into your programming, you invest into, in your talent, you invest in your marketing. So it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a struggle for black media companies. Um, but it's an, an unnecessary struggle because we have the power to do anything we want to do. We run the world, we run the culture, but we have to understand how it works if they're only giving us 1% and there's a hundred dollars, what you gonna do with a dollar? And everybody else got $50, $40, and you only have a dollar. And so that's putting it in layman's terms. But it's such an importance to, it's such an importance to have black media, to have that representation. And so the fight, the fight continues. A lot of the stuff they said from, um, you know, George Floyd and trying to keep everything calm, they, they haven't done those things. And so the, 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 the beauty about it is that we're seeing, we're seeing what time it is. Today is the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. And 60 years later, things haven't changed because we have to change them. We have to change the tone. And the only tone is through love, through unity. If we don't love ourselves and really get past that part of us in this room, forget all the statistics, everybody else that's out there, but us in this room unifying and being accountable, pooling money together, pooling resources together. It's, it, if we don't do it, we're doomed, you know what I'm saying? And the time is now. And we could do it. We have one of the most powerful entrepreneur generations in the history of our communities. Look at all these people out here. We want the information. Right. People want to be able to be successful. So we at least have that appetite, but we got to put the love in it for ourselves to recognize that, 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 that we're not getting what we're supposed to get and that we have to fight for it. 
This is crazy. So first, let me just say thank you, because when we started Earn Your Leisure, it was interesting. One of the goals that we had was like, can we make it to Revolt? Because we saw that you guys had an eye for young talent that were trying to make a change. And so we sat down with Derek Ferguson, who you may know very well, right? And he said something interesting to us. He said, listen, you guys have created a white flame. And we were like, what, what does that mean, Derek? He said, I've seen Puff do it four times. He did it with Bad Boy, he did it with Ciroc, he did it with Revolt, and he's did it with Sean John. So I wanna talk about Sean John a little bit, because coming up in the 90s, late 90s, by far my favorite clothing brand. And we saw what that did for high level fashion. I don't wanna call it urban fashion, because that would be labeling. I wanna talk about high level fashion, because it was on Fifth Avenue when we were going to that store. I know it was sold, but recently, you got it back. So talk about that journey to creating this brand of high-level fashion, high-level luxury, selling it, and now getting it back, and the, the, the purpose for it now, what's the vision for it? Yeah, um, even though they try to put us in a box with Sean John, I just didn't let them. Like, my, my thoughts were, I have to dream bigger than you know what the reality is planned for me. And so with Sean John as a fashion label, I didn't want it to be just about streetwear. So that's why you saw the Sean John suits, the fragrance, the, all the things that a major white fashion house would have. I went and I broke down those doors to make sure that it happened. But most importantly, it was just the, 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 the striking lack of black talent in the world of fashion when I got into the world of fashion and I wanted to change that. And so the only way I could do that is I had to think past being urban, past being streetwear. And I was able to go into so many different categories from kids to luggage to um, fragrances. Footwear. Footwear. And so I sold the company and you know, it, 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 didn't, it wasn't the same without me, you know? And so I got an opportunity to get it back. And so right now, we are in development for the return of Sean John. And it's something I'm very, very proud of. So talk about the- I, I wanna just say like the Sean John journey was such a positive experience and it has been, and it really broke down doors. So when you see Pharrell, head of Louis Vuitton, or you see different cats, you see um, Fear of God. These opportunities weren't there, and to know that, that we played a part in creating that opportunity is, is truly a blessing. Talk about the process of selling your mind frame and then your mind frame and buying it back. A lot of black businesses get criticized when they sell. Um, I don't think that it's always fair, but that's a different story. So what's your thought process in that, and then What's your thought process in buying it back? And was there hurdles and obstacles in actually able to, you know, want purchasing it back? I mean, I bought it back because I saw there was an opportunity. I saw that the, the operators weren't operating it correctly. And so, you know, I was like, you know, let me get that back. <laughs> you know, I know, I, know, I know what to do with that. And so, but, but as far as selling, we here for business. We here to sell things. Don't be in so personally invested to a point when you don't know when to get out. That's at another level. You have to know when to sell, when to get out, because we have to generate wealth. The only way you could generate wealth is by selling some of your assets when they are at their highest level of profitability. And so don't be afraid to build a company and sell it and buy another company and sell it um, and so that, that was my thing. If, if these companies that I have, you know, at, at the end of the day, they're, they're businesses, except for like, I would say revolt, you know, so, you know, all of those businesses, me as an entrepreneur, that's on my table. If I'm at 125th street, that's on my table right there. You know, <laughs> revolt. I'm like, no, I can't let y'all get that data. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I would say at that point, you know what I'm saying? I was just trying to build my wealth. And I had an opportunity with Sean John to build some wealth and, and, and I was able to sell it and God blessed it to come back to me full circle. So that watch out for Sean John, y'all. The Velour Suits is coming back. 
But Lord Suits definitely coming back. <laughs> Thank God. There's a God somewhere. So it's interesting when you, when you talk about your portfolio there, and I know you got a strong team. We've met with a lot of the guys, brilliant minds. And that's one of the, the best things is like surround yourself with brilliant minds and you're going to pick up a lot. When it's time to look at businesses, is there something that you look to or a philosophy that you have when it's saying, all right, we should go after that one or maybe this one isn't going to work? Because I know a lot of opportunities come your way. So, yeah. so how do you say yes and no to them? I mean, if you look at what I bet on, I bet on black. I bet on black culture. I, ble I, I bet on black business. And I really get an opportunity to, to, to see early on, like, what's really hot and what I should invest in. Um, usually the things I'm trying to invest in, you know, other corporations are not really going in that direction because they're not trying to support and they're not trying to hear the ideas of black or brown entrepreneurs. So I, t I take full advantage of that and make sure that it, it's, it's in line with my purpose. And as long as it's in line with my purpose, I'm always looking for a genius, always looking for somebody to invest in from my community. And, 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 and that has been, you know, something that I've done all my life. So I want to talk about business structure. You did something early, I believe in the 90s, that most hip hop labels, no hip hop label I don't think was doing. The traditional business model for hip hop artists and labels is you have an, a CPA, you have a business manager, right? And the business manager gets a percentage and you end up paying a variety of different people. And I believe that, I have inside information on this, but I believe you, um, <laughs> you fired your business manager and you hired a CFO, yes, Derek Ferguson, right? Put him on salary. So now he's not getting a percentage of every single thing that's happening, but it's also a more structured, streamlined situation. That's extremely impressive business acumen to have, especially somebody that's never went to business school, graduated. Yeah. What, should, what made you want to operate in that corporate model as opposed to the artist model? Uh, when I was an artist, I was losing so much money. <laughs> and I was like, I need somebody to sit here every day and watch this money. Like, just literally watch it. Watch it grow, watch it play. If we catch a loss, run to my office and tell me. And so that's one of the first people y'all need to hire <laughs> is a CFO. You know, when you build, when you finally getting it and building up your organization, because you want that to be in-house. You want to be able to watch your money. You want to be able to touch it. You want to be able to understand what's going on. And so I had to just learn that from corporate America and um, really brought it in, and, and it really leveled everything up for me as, as far as the way I was dealing with finances. Yeah, one of the things that we see all the time, we, we see these, these, these throwback videos of that, that puff energy, and, and it, it's, it's infectious, right? Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> we, and shout out to Lou, he's back there. We, we always get on about the phone incident. Uh, but talk about the messaging behind that, right? Are you doing, obviously it's a passion for you, but is it because you want to inspire the people around you to have the same energy? Or is it something that's just as natural to you? It's like, you know what, yeah. I'm a hustler. If you're not a hustler, get it from, get from around me. I'm, I feel like I'm playing for the team, for a team, you know, and the team I'm playing for is us. And so when I'm going in with that intensity, everything that I do that I'm breaking down, I'm like, yeah, somebody else could come behind me after I was able to break this down. I, I just see this hole in the wall. I'm like, come on in, y'all. And, and, and so y'all may, y'all remember that video when I was like, I'm a savage, I'm a savage. I'm a savage. Whatever I want, I get. Whatever I want, I get. Yeah. And that was, that was the change of the tone. And so when I'm talking y'all today, tonight, move on. Yeah. So, um, that energy is the energy that you need to have. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I had to switch up my tone. Um, cause when you are working with corporate America, you trying to, you know, just make sure everything is smooth. Nothing's rattled. Everybody keeps their jobs. And I had to change the tone. I realized that nobody was going to give me what I wanted. So even being on that phone, I was taking what was mine. So, it's that energy, that energy that you have to go beyond just dreaming about it, 
beyond talking about it, writing it in your journal. You have to get your ass up and go take that. Take what's yours. And I'm not talking about steal from anybody. Don't steal from nobody. Not that way. But it's your dreams. You got to manifest it and you got to take it with that intense energy. So as far as I believe there's like 13 black billionaires in, in America. You're one of them. It's almost an impossible feat to accomplish. Wait, hold on, wait. There's no claps for that? That should be standing to your love, feet. Love, love, it's a love, black love, billionaire. Love, you kidding me? Love, love, love. Everybody should be up. Love, love. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> You know where he's from? <laughs> New York. Yo, we can never, we can never normalize ah, being a billionaire. Not an everyday man. thing, man. By the way, we know almost all of them. Yeah. Also true. That's a fact. We'll have, we'll have another one tomorrow. That's a yeah. fact. Finesse is only. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to be careful with that, y'all. When they talk about us having money and y'all look at us, it's, it's truly an illusion of inclusion. Well, talk like, about I can't, that. I can't play a part of the illusion of inclusion. So you're looking here at me like I'm totally included. No, I'm fighting for the same thing I was fighting for when I got into the game, but it's at another level. And so, and so it's very important to understand this is the truth. Out of all the billionaires in the world, the world got almost 9 billion people in it. There's only 16 black billionaires. So that's the illusion. So every time, you know, yeah, it feels good for one of us to get in, two to get in, but we, but, but we got to stop taking the crumbs. It's time for way more of us out of 9 billion. I want 2 billion to be billionaires. I don't want nothing less for myself or my people. That's why I was going to ask you as far as being such in, in rare space. What is, how does, who do you talk to? Like, I know obviously it's you and Jay, a few other people, but what's, very few people can relate to the challenges, to the struggles, to the financial difficulties, different things of that nature that happen at, at that level. Somebody said something that was very interesting to us one time. We was talking about a person that's extremely successful and his, his, his former friend, and they like, well, you never think about the winner's perspective. Everybody always sympathizes with the loser, but what about the winner? What about things that he has to go through, the trauma that he has? So what is that for you, knowing that you're one of 12 people in America, like who do you talk to? How's that social circle? How is it being in that environment? What are some of the challenges? Like how does that actually look for you? I mean, it's definitely lonely. It's not a lot of people to talk to. I mean, I, I talk to Jay or some other friends, um, but it's, I mean, when I look at it, I, I just know the truth that it's not enough wealth being spread around, you know, and so I'm at this point and that's what energizes me. I don't, I don't really look at it, you know, as far as like, okay, I'm a billionaire. I'm more like, my, you know, my people are not doing good. Yes, I, I'm blessed to be a billionaire, but at the same time, you know, if my people aren't doing good, then I can't be settled. Because well, we, we met, we talked to Nas, and he was saying, like, you know, he's been doing a lot of venture capital investing, and he's been killing it. And I'm paraphrasing, but he was like, the higher up he moves, the more discouraged he gets. Yeah. Because the, he's, he's into different circles now, and he's aware of information. And he's realizing how much money is out there and how little money we have. Where He didn't really fully understand that before. So it's, it's an interesting paradigm, right? The higher up you move, the more discouraged you get because yeah. you're seeing it from a different perspective. Like you're seeing it from the mountain as yes. opposed to seeing it from the street. Yeah, yeah. So just sitting here, uh, this is 30 years of experience of seeing at things at a level that, you know, most people haven't seen it at. And so it's important that I, I tell people the truth. That's why I say, like, the time is now. No one is coming to save us because I'm at that mountain and I'm seeing the oppression that's still at that level. And because they put us in the media like we're doing so good, y'all don't feel that that level of 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 the stoppage of creating wealth. So when it gets when it gets up to that point and we talk about generational wealth, 
we're fighting just to get like normal wealth, but we're so, so caught up in like, okay, a billionaire or this or that, that we're not understanding that once you get to that level, there's even more, there's even more obstacles that are ahead of you. To, to, to kind of say my, my experience in that is, I, I want to tell you about this, this story about me running the marathon. So I decided to run the marathon, and I decided like six weeks before the marathon. Yeah, I was crazy. Um, usually got to train eight months. I only ran like 10 days before. You know, I was partying the days before. <laughs> and on the 10th mile, I hit a wall and I felt like I was literally going to die and I wanted to stop. I hit that level. I hit that ceiling in business, but I had to keep going. So I'm in pain. I'm struggling, but I had to keep going. And that's kind of a metaphor, you know, for my life and for everybody who is in here that's on the road of being an entrepreneur. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You're gonna hit these obstacles and there's different levels, there's different miles, there's different levels of intensity. And so I was able to make it and finish the marathon. And I was able to kind of take that with me and apply it to business. And so, you know, at this point, you know, in the position that I'm in, I had to really look at like, what does, you know, the next half of my life look like? And I had to really, really, really look at what I wanted to do and, and make sure that I finished this marathon the right way. Because cause me just completing the race, that ain't what I want to do. I want to win the race. I want to win the race. I want us to win the race. Yeah, it's interesting. So it's 30 years of business for yeah. you. It's 50 years of hip hop. When we met, you looked at us and you said, I love y'all brothers because what y'all been able to do, we've never been able to do in hip hop. And that's make it cool to be educated. So when I wonder when you look at the landscape from your perspective, right? Because you are at a different level. Do you feel encouraged about this movement of financial power, financial literacy, financial education that you're seeing? I mean, I love what you guys are doing. I love what you guys are doing. Um, the beauty about everybody here is they, they took that step. Everybody here, y'all took that step. Y'all took accountability to come here and learn. Give yourselves a round of applause. Nobody, nobody's hiding the knowledge. There's not like no secret conspiracy that they're hiding the knowledge. You have to make a decision that you want to be financially literate. You have to make that decision. And so, you know, um, seeing you guys be successful, being able to support y'all, and seeing so many come out, people come out and changing the narrative to the importance of being financially literate is something that I got to honestly say you guys are responsible for. You guys are responsible for that shift. So I applaud you on that. Thank you. I, w I, w I, I want to. Can I circle back to something though? Because I want to make sure I give you the true answer. So he's talking about levels, and I kind of just got it right now. Even though the levels and the marathon, it goes together. Um, but there's a level that you you get to, and you're successful, and you get to the point of being successful. And as a black person there's this thing that kicks in. There's this jealousy that kicks in. There's this fear that kicks in. Then they start to burn things down. Then they start to take the money out the Freedom Bank. Then they go back on the 40 acres and the mule. Then we don't deserve our worth. So even, even whole J, None of us are immune to it. He had to sue Bacardi to get his worth. Like they, they, they make us at the next level. You think that you've overcome everything. Oh, I finally made it. And then there's a whole nother army up there that is there to try to push you down the hill. And that's why 
from being at the mountaintop, I could come back down and tell y'all the only way out of this is if we can unify and combine our forces because what's waiting for you up there Yo, that's, that's, um, that's pretty insightful. That's actually ill. That's like a metaphor of like you seeing the opposition on the other side <laughs> and you like reporting back, like yes, yes. I'm letting you know what's yes. happening. Like you can't see it, but I'm actually seeing it. So to the ground troops, we got to, you know what I'm saying? Like this is actually crazy. That's, that's, that's pretty dope that Don't you said that. I want to ask you this. This is important. You have dealt with a lot of criticism, right? A lot of people have villainized your character. Nobody's immune to feeling certain ways about how people talk about them on social media. I'd be ready to lose it when somebody talks about me on social media. So I know, like, you know what I'm saying, other people that have way bigger followings than me, it's, it's difficult. And for people who are just in the crowd, right, there's always going to be somebody that's a hater. There's always going to be somebody that has nothing negative to say about somebody or somebody has their own narrative. How are you able to deal with that and still, you know, be able to just keep tunnel vision? I'm laser focused on the mission. I'm laser focused on change. I'm laser focused on my purpose. None of that noise means anything. And, you know, I know my truth. Um, you know, in order to be a leader, I do have to, in this day and age of social media, I do have to address all types of things that need to be cleared up. But... It's, it's not because of, of my ego or being hurt. It's just more about history. And right now, the internet and the way things work, you can read some, something about somebody and think it's the truth. And so it's easy to villainize somebody. But um, I'm comfortable with my receipts, and I know, I know my purpose, and I know that I, I'm sent here on God's mission. So knowing that, I don't even really go into the comments and do that to myself, you know. I hear different things that are negative. You hear things that are positive, you know, and, 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 and that's life. I got to just stay focused, laser focused. I can't get into none of that noise. I'm on a mission to, to shake the world, you know, for my people, and that's it. Before we go, I do want to talk about music, give you opportunity. I know you got a new product that you're working on. What made you even want to do that 30 years later and still have a passion for music? We started with Bad Boy. Let's talk about Love Records. Right? Yeah, let's talk about Love Records. How, anybody out there miss True R&B? Make some noise on my True R&B lovers. Yeah, so handling all this business, it kind of kind of messed up my creativity <laughs> and I stopped being creative I stopped doing what I love to do and I, I had to make a decision like yeah I want to I want to fight this fight but at the same time I want to be happy and so music is the thing that makes me happy music is, is is the thing that makes me feel like a child music is the thing that saved my life and so getting a second chance when I when I took control of just like Okay, I'm gonna really take control of my future. Um, and I said, I, I need to do things that I love to do. I know that I'm successful in business, but these Zooms is killing me, begging these people are killing me, and ta all that stuff. And I was like, man, I, I gotta get back to my love. And so I made an album called The Love Album, Off the Grid. It comes out September 15th, and it's, it's really my love story. Um, and it's, it's performed. Um, about me through some of my favorite, through the talents of some of my favorite artists in the world, from uh, Jasmine Sullivan to Summer Walker to The Weeknd, and so on and so Mary J. Blige. It's, it's, it's almost like this. It's the Super Bowl of R&B. This is the Super Bowl of Hustlers. The Love Albums, the Super Bowl of R&B. Love, 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 love. So, love, 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 love. So, so this, this is Invest Fest, right? So this is like, you know, when you go to like these musical festivals and big moments happen at these type of festivals. So I felt like Invest Fest, a big moment has to happen in yeah. front of at, yeah, I got, I got a thousand people. At the, I mean, it's the Super Bowl, right? I got, it's the Super Bowl. What we Bowl. doing? It's the Super what Bowl. What we doing, Daddy? We, we, what, what we going to do is we going to move 
We're going to move with action. We're going to change the tone. We're going to start to put our money where our mouth is and start investing in each other and with each other. Everybody asks the question, why, why don't y'all get together and all do something? That's exactly what we have to do. So I feel like right now is a perfect place to start to do that. And what you guys have done for financial literacy, I think it's time that y'all go to the next level. It's time to go to the next level. So I got, let me, let me get that, Corey, please. Got something I want to present to y'all. That Millie? Yeah. That Millie? Yeah. Oh, boy. That yeah. Millie? Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. Love, love, yeah. love. Oh, boy. Love, love. Yeah. Okay. So, so... so so about it. Yeah, and I don't want to be clear about this check. <laughs> I, want be, I want to be crystal clear in front of everybody. So, I'm getting that watch that you got. No, no. no. <laughs> I, I, I hear you guys always talk about what you want to invest in and what you're doing. And I know you have your own investments. But I wanted to create a fund that was special so you guys can invest and show people through this investment how you're making money. And also, all of the proceeds of, of this are going to go to my schools in New York. Capital Prep. I have three schools in New York, one in the Bronx, one in my neighborhood of Harlem, one in Connecticut. So for so as partners, my piece is going to the school and your piece is going to whoever you want to give it to. <laughs> I would give it I would give it to myself first if I <laughs> Nah, so what we going to do is like Diddy said, man, he's giving us a million dollars. We go, you watch Market Mondays all the time. You watch On Your Leisure all the time. You always talk about investing. So, you know, put your money where your mouth is, right? So this is going to be an opportunity. We're going to actually create content around it. We're going to do different investments. So we're going to show you guys how we're actually investing the money. And like he says, the proceeds of that will go to charity. And um, it's just why not, man? So Diddy, a legend love. in the game. A million dollars cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, 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 love. Yeah. Love, love. yeah. I want to... I ain't going to lie, that's kind of ill right here. <laughs> yeah, man. Nah, I, 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 I just want to be clear on the importance of us really unifying, of us not being afraid to invest in each other, of us starting to trust each other. We got to start trusting each other. We got to start loving each other. We got to start supporting each other. And you guys deserve this. Yeah. I'm not doing this out of charity. This is a great business move. Okay, so congratulations. Thank y'all very much. Love, appreciate you.